בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, great to be at the lighthouse project again. בעזרת השם, we'll continue our series that we started a few weeks ago about מוסר, פרקי אבות. Uh, also, before I forget, because I tend to forget these, uh, you know, people that have sponsored this year here at the Lighthouse Project, uh, Justin Saka, in the uh, memory of Ilu uh, Nishmat, Bahi Aslata Bat Shmuel, Daniel and Cindy Winterman, in the honor of uh, Leah Bat uh, Michael Bat, uh, 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 Bat Mitzvah, uh, Tovia and Stephanie Eisenberg, in the honor of Refua Shlema and uh, of Menachem Mendel ben Sara Batya, Jack and Tara ben Melech, in the honor of Refua Shlema for Dvora Feig Bat Rezel. And also thank you to Torah Anytime for uh, publicizing our shiurs. Anyone that's interested in uh, watching our shiurs, or many shiurim, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, many of them on TorahAnytime.com and also on my website, BeZratHashem.org. So the uh, series that we started a few weeks ago was about Musar, about Pirkei Avot, and uh, one of the reasons why we decided to do that with Sati Dishmaya is that we realized that many of us have learned about the mitzvot, we learn about the halachot, and if you go to any shul anywhere in the world, it uh, tends to be Baruch Hashem, in, the, in today's world it's easy and allowed to learn halacha. And uh, in most cases, you'll see that there are several shiurim per day about different halachot. Sometimes they'll do it between prayers. Sometimes they'll do it in the middle of a prayer, right before the end of the prayer. Sometimes they'll have shiurim in the uh, middle of the day or chaburas uh, at night. Bo Hashem, learning halacha has become very, very simple. Which means that anyone that actually wants to know what, you know, what you need to do in order to get closer and closer to Hashem on a regular basis as far as the action is concerned, it's become very easy. The problem is not knowing what halacha is, because even if you can't go to synagogue, you can learn things online. You go on websites, you go on YouTube, you go on tour anytime, you go on just countless websites and sources of where you can learn halacha. And of course, you always have the books. And even today, Hashem has made it easy enough for the books to arrive all the way at your house just by a click of a button. But that is not our problem today. Our problem is not that we don't know halacha. Our problem today is that we have a hard time understanding how to be human beings, how to behave, how to have shalom bayit, how to raise children, how to be business partners, how to even conduct business, how to stop desecrating Hashem's name on a regular basis with our kippah on, and stop making Judaism look so bad. To people like I used to be, a, a secular person, where I would go to the casino, and for me it was normal. I was secular, I was doing what I wanted to do, but then I would see the guy with the stray mole and the hat and everything, and he's in the same table as me playing Texas Hold'em. To me, it didn't look normal. I'm like, okay, me, I belong here. You, you don't belong here. There's something wrong with this picture. So, the problem is not that he didn't know the halacha. It's not the problem. He you knows it's not allowed to gamble. I wasn't allowed to gamble, he wasn't allowed to gamble. I just didn't know I wasn't allowed to gamble. But what made him make this horrendous mistake, and one of the major foundations of, 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 of Judaism and Torah in general, is the whole t thought process and teachings of Musar. Musar is ethics. And Pirkei Avot, which is part of the Mishnah, preceded the Gemara, it's the foundation of all Musar. All Musar that we learn today, whether we learn it from the Gemara itself, or we learn it from different tzaddikim, you know, whether it's from our generation or from a few hundred years ago, everything stems from, in some way or another, from the teachings of the sages, from Pirkei Avot. So, rather than leading, you know, reading one particular focus, we go through the whole series of Bezat Hashem. You know, we're going to try to do this whole series, go through every single Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. But right now, we're actually up to Mishnah Aleph Vav, which is the sixth Mishnah in the entire Masechet. Yeshua ben Parchia v'nitai arbeli kiblu mehem. Yeshua ben Parchia and Nitai of Arbel received tradition from them, meaning this Yeshua, one of the major Tanaim throughout history, who uh, lived the 
approximately 200 years before the destruction of the second temple, received, and Nittai of Arbel received from them. Who is them? It's the same sages that we talked about in last night's shiur, which were two preceding Tanaim, which was uh, Yosef ben Yohanan and Yosef ben Yoezel. So it shows that throughout the Mishnah you'll see how the Torah emphasizes on how everything has lineage, everything has a source, it's no one's original idea. No one has an original idea other than God. If you have an original idea, you keep it to yourself. God's the only idea we care about. God's the only opinion we care about. So here we see that every single time Mishnah is mentioned, each sage mentions where he got it from. And of course, his sage, his teacher, his rabbi, tells where I got it from. And eventually you see the first Mishnah. Where did the, where did the first Mishnah start? Moses got it from Mount Sinai. So we know that everything starts from Mount Sinai. That's the first Mishnah. And on and on we continue going. So now we see that these, this Mishnah over here was received from the previous sages. And this is what the Mishnah says. Yeshua ben Barachia says, Make a teacher for yourself, which, uh, make a choir friend for yourself, and judge everyone favorably. This, in my opinion, is one of the most critical Mishnayot relevant to our generation today. Not that I know the entire Torah, to even know that what's the most important one, there's no one more, more important than the other, but it's more important in regards to the subject matter that I mentioned earlier about this confusion that we have on a regular basis of not knowing how to behave, not knowing what to do, not knowing who to follow, and you see that the massive amount of confusion usually has one answer. Because you see that there's always been different sects within Judaism, and you know, unless you're talking about Mount Sinai, everyone was the same. There's no Sephardic, there's no Ashkenazi, there's no Yemenite. Everyone was the same. But throughout times, Am Yisrael was spread into the four corners of the world. Some people to Australia, some people to Yemen, some people to Europe, and some people to America, and so on. So you develop different cultures, but the Torah itself stayed the same. The fact that different there's different customs amongst different uh, cultures is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But the halacha itself, the rules, stayed the same. But if you've noticed, in the last generation, the customs have gone out of control. In the last generation, the customs have become superior to halacha. The customs have become superior to the actual law we got from Mount Sinai. And that cannot be. That is against the Torah. And the answer to why is what we're going to talk about today. If you notice, there's just to mention a few horrific sects within groups. This is not to identify any one group that's worse than the other or better than the other. This is to identify the, the ugliness within each because we're all in the same boat. If one guy is sinning, I, I'm also in trouble for it. If you're sinning, I'm also in trouble for it. If I'm sinning, you're in trouble for it. We're all in the same boat. So it doesn't matter if it's Chabad or it's breast level, or it's this one or it's that one. It makes no difference. But the point is that we all need to look in the mirror once in a while and see that there's a problem. You see that there's, there was an extraordinary rabbi, the Satmer Rabbi. The Satmer Rabbi was a huge Talmud Chacham, a big tzaddik, and had his certain beliefs that we weren't allowed to go into Eretz Israel. Whether he's right, he's wrong, it's irrelevant. What he didn't intend on doing is having his students evolve into the mutants that the Neturek Karta have become. The Satmer in general, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But out of the Satmer came this other organization called Neturek Karta Imach Shimam. Why am I saying Imach Shimam? Why am I cursing them like you curse J.C. Penny? Why am I cursing them like you curse the terrorists? Because they've become part of the terrorists. They've become a walking Chilul Hashem where they wear their Jewish uniform, but what are they doing during this, uh, during this proceeding? 
they, get, they shake hands with the Iranians that are telling us they want to annihilate all the Jews in the world. They're getting money from terrorists. But it looks holy because to the world who doesn't know anything the difference between a Jew that's religious and a Jew that's not religious. Everybody's Jewish. It looks good. Oh, look, these are nice Jews. Look, they're getting along with the Arabs. Why can't everybody get along with the Arabs? So obviously the Satmi Rebbe, who was a huge Talmud Chacham, did not intend for this to happen. He says, no, no, if, if, I'm sure he's much, much more bitter about it than what I'm saying today here. It's no different with the Chabadnikim today that have turned their holy rabbi, Rabbi Milvavich, into a Mashiach. This is complete nonsense. It's against the Torah. He died. He's a big tzaddik. Maybe he was a potential Mashiach when he was alive. But once he died, he died. Rabbi Yudanasi, Rebbe, the original Rebbe, the one that's mentioned in the Mishnah, the one that all of the sages, all of the sages in the Torah, the ones that gave us our Torah, said that if somebody is, 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 could be the Mashiach in our generation, it's Rebbe. Rabbi Yudanasi, why? He was the perfect human being. Huge tzaddik. Accepted all of the Isurim, all of the sacrifices and suffering with love. Years and years of suffering with love. All the fortune that he had, he didn't enjoy one penny of it. He knew the entire Torah by heart. He put together our Mishnah. The only reason we have Torah is because of him. And they say, listen, as soon as he died, that's it. He couldn't be the Mashiach anymore. So if Rebbe, from 2,500 years ago, couldn't be the Mashiach because he died, so obviously... Rabbi from Lovavitch can't be the Mashiach, he died. Big tzaddik. But the problem is that his students are not listening to his teachings. They're not listening to his teachings because he never said, I'm the Mashiach. If he was the Mashiach, he would say, Listen, guys, by the way, Geula is here, I'm the Mashiach. Wait for me, I'll be back in a few years. I'm the Mashiach. You wouldn't leave it in hiding because according to the Torah, if you look at the prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, you look at the prophecy in the book of Zechariah, you look at the prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, you look at the prophets, the ones that gave us the word of Hashem, they said that the Mashiach is going to be obvious. It's not going to be some mysterious thing. Oh, gonna, is he Mashiach? Is he not Mashiach? Is he black? Is he white? Is he Yemenite? Maybe he likes us. Maybe not. There's, no, there's no mystery. When Mashiach is here. The whole world's going to know. Just like Hashem made sure that everyone knows that Mount Sinai is happening, just like Hashem made sure that the, the sea that split, everyone knew. Even Rachav, Rachav, which eventually became the wife of Joshua, Yeshua Benun, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, the one that followed Moshe Rabbeinu, she said, we heard about your God. What do you mean you heard? How'd you hear? You were over here, we're at Mount Sinai. Well, you have TV. You have radio, what do you have? We saw what Hashem did in the sky. Hashem made a projection for everyone to see what happened. So if to give us the Torah, He made sure that everyone knew the culmination of the world is going to be bigger. So he's not going to do it in secret. You're not going to guess if he's the Mashiach, he's not the Mashiach. But the students are not listening to the rabbi. And what happens when you don't listen to him? You get even worse. And this week I got news that there's a, another stem of call themselves Chabad that are calling themselves Elokistim. Elokistim means they've turned the Rebbe into God. Where they said that once he left this world, he became one with God, Hashem Rachem. Became one with God, and now he's running the world. And now you no longer need to do mitzvot. And on this video, this is not like a uh, rumor. This is, this is an actual article. There's a video of these people saying this. And you see them bowing to the picture of the Rebbe, eating pork, talking about how initially when she first started eating on Yom Kippur, she was initially scared, but then she started reading and she was fine. So now she eats pork. On Yom Kippur, no Shabbat, no Tefillin, no Tarat Mishpacha, no modesty. You don't have to do mitzvot anymore. Why? Because the Rebbe became God. Desecrating the Holy Rebbe and 
followed so hard, so closely with their stupidity. Pure, pure stupidity. And unfortunately you have... Can I ask you a question? You get me finish the point, then you can ask. Or go ahead, if you point out, go ahead, if it's the same issue. You're, 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 you're speaking about some things, which I'm not really sure why you're speaking about them, but do you know any of the people in that video that you saw? Do I know them? Yeah. What do you mean, do I know them? Do I know them personally? Yeah. No. Okay, so I do. Okay. And it's, you should know, it's unbecoming of you even to talk about them because they're the mentally ill people. Yeah, but the, this is just part of a group. This is not necessarily the five people. You obviously, even, that's my next question. How many of the Rebbe students do you even know personally? Do you know anyone? I know a few, yeah. yeah. Anyone in the category that you're described today? Meaning what? Meaning that they're, they believe he's the Mashiach? Yes. You're, you're, you're talking about things that... Uh, Offend you. It's unbecoming of you in a platform of Torah to talk about because they're... You're talking about people that, that, are, that are, have worse problems than the problems you're describing. And you're labeling a certain group in a way that is completely inappropriate. It seems that you don't know any of the people here, or maybe you don't know what you're talking about, because the, the groups that you're describing are not what you're describing. I, 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 I don't right, but see, the thing is, the difference is, is what you have to understand is that in order to know what someone's talking about it, what someone is talking about, you first have to hear what they're talking about. Now, to assume you know my point before I completed it is a failed assumption. You've already failed before you started. To assume you know my point before I've completed what I'm trying to tell you, I'm you're, 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 you're I'm just out of, you're talking out of context. I'm happy to wait, but I'm not addressing your point. I mean, I don't, it's irrelevant your point right now. You're talking about things that are real. In the, in the they're happening. You're telling me that no one in Chabad is actually saying the, the Rebbe is Mashiach? It's not Ola. They're not walking, they're not driving around with a, uh, with a car and, and, and big uh, po uh, post billboard saying uh, Rebbe is the Mashiach? The whole Chabad movement. I'm not saying, but this is exactly what I said. Obviously, you're missing the point. I'm not saying this is Chabad. I said this is cults within Chabad. And I said it in the beginning of the lecture. So, if you let me complete my point, then you would see that there is a sect within Chabad, and then there's Chabad. There's the founders of Chabad, and who they were, as I described their rabbi, he's a big tzaddik, no questions asked, I wish I could be his shoe. But the students, or the ones that call themselves the students, are not all following what he said. Because what he said was in accordance with the Torah. What some of them are doing is against the Torah. Obviously, they can't be, can't be in the same book. So, the fact that it's offensive, the fact that it's disturbing, is the point. Because it's happening, and no one's talking about it. That's why I'm talking about it. Because this is one of the huge things that is causing confusion for people from all walks of life, whether they're coming from a secular lifestyle, and they're looking at these people and they're saying there's something wrong with them, or it's people coming from a different religion called Christianity, and they're saying, wait, they're not doing anything different than us. Or it's coming from people that... Do you think that's what's confusing people who are being introduced to Judaism and seeing some of these things? Or is it that people are coming to a Torah class to hear something of substantial and the, the teachers get carried away with things that are absolutely irrelevant to, to anything of, of... It's not relevant to maybe something you want to... Yes, I'm taking should be so, well, I'm a simple person. I came to learn. And I, why this is the way I teach. You, are not, you do not have to listen to me. Right. This is what I teach. I may say this is how I teach. I may say something. Yeah. Uh, I'm not from, from birth, but I, I know from my own experience, when you start looking for something, you know, for the truth, it can be very, and it's very, it's very confusing. Because you hear and you see these people and you see those people. No, no, it, these people, There's a lot of streams and a plethora of, you know, choices that you have to make and you have to find the truth. And I agree with this. People that are not representing the truth and met, they diffuse. Mm -hmm. And it's, that is, that's a very unfortunate. So that's basically the point. With all due respect to everyone that's listening, whether here or online or anywhere else, again, There's the point... Is not true. One is true. How are you supposed to look for the truth? How are you supposed to find the truth? The, the, point, the, the, point, I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make you know, is... If you have a good teacher, if you have nine that are not... They, they, all of them say, I'm a good teacher. That's true. 
Everybody says, I way. found the Emet here. That's a challenge. That's a challenge all over. Now he, you are lost. You not, can't he's find not the addressing truth. your question. You have a very good question. Finding a teacher is like finding a doctor or a good someone. But they're therapist. all there. They're all claiming to be a great teacher. But that's not the point that he's addressing. This is the point that we're getting. Eventually, I may get to that point. I don't know. Who knows? If I actually start talking at some point. I know we're going to get to this point. But you're starting at a premise. That's, that's disturbing to you. It's, no, it's not healthy. And it's not healthy for who? For, for you. Why is it not healthy for me? For you. Because if you're trying to make a point from a group of ill people, that is not showing that you have a mind to represent, to understand how to expound your point properly. I may not or teach in your you style. Start at a point, to bring at a point from a minority, that's not even a minority, that's people that are not well. If you want to bring that well intellectual point, you bring it up from intellectual. Would you like to give the class? You're not giving the class. You're bringing negativity into a holy place. Maybe, maybe and it's maybe. very sad to see someone that became from someone that was negative and became from and is bringing negativity here. It's a, it's it's it's. it's very it's uncomfortable. It's, uncomf it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to hear, but it's reality. Let me finish. It's not about the point. It's about yes. what someone. Isn't it interesting that we're learning Musar and how to behave, but yet they won't let the speaker speak? Exactly. Let, let's listen. Let's try and. You don't have to listen. Again, this is not jail. Everyone is welcome to sit. They're welcome to listen. They're welcome to learn. They're welcome to criticize. But you still have to let me do my job. So, I'm here for free. Your job is not bringing negativity into this whole base message. That's not your job. I'm trying to bring enlightenment. This is not light at all. You I feel terror. I spent to hundreds of sure and feel beauty of terror. Correct. This is not light. Okay. Let's continue, please. For you, it may not be light, but for somebody else, it may be light. So, thank you. Let's continue. So, we have, a, we have issues in all sects of Judaism, obviously, as you can see. The problem of opinions, throwing around our opinions, making sure that we make uh, our voice heard, is uh, not uh, unique among any one of the cultures. But the reality of it is that the problem, the systemic problem, it exists everywhere. And not to forget, uh, you know, obviously this negativity amongst all sects. It's not just Chabad. It's not just Netulay Kata. Obviously, there's some Breslev movers, you know, the people that instead of following Rabbi Nachman from Breslev or Rav Arush, that's in essence the first, the current leader, they spend most of their time breakdancing on the street and not necessarily learning Torah. Then you have people that throw rocks on Shabbat against people that are not keeping Shabbat, thinking that they're doing a mitzvah. So, facing reality is what we need to do. If we don't face reality, we'll never fix it. I ran a multi-million dollar company, and I know that we had problems at times, and we had great things at times. If I ignored the problems, we would have never succeeded. If someone has a small pain on his right side, and he ignores it, and it doesn't go away, he should take care of it. If he doesn't take care of it, he turns into something bigger. But by the time he decides to deal with it, it's so big that it becomes bigger than him, it can become a systemic problem. So we run out of the room after making our voices heard and wasting everybody's time without actually dealing with the problem and just calling the problem negative. Yeah, of course it's negative. If you want another shiur about etrogim, or another shiur about some alachot for, for, for sukkah, or you want some, uh, you know, shiur about some neutral subject like a uh, shlom bite, you have plenty of other classes to go to. I'm here to give a reality check. I'm here to address the problem. The problem is that we're not facing the problem. That's the problem. The problem is that we're running away from the problem. We want to go to neutral classes that talk about positive mindsets. And if I think okay, it's going to be okay. If I think good, it'll be good. What about the fact that you drive on Shabbat and you desecrate it on a regular basis? That doesn't matter? You just think good? If I think my marriage is going to be okay, it's going to be okay. What about the fact that you cheat on her every Tuesday with your girlfriend? That 
Doesn't matter. Ignore that. If I think, okay, I'm eventually going to lose weight. So the fact that you eat burgers every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, that's not going to affect your weight? It's mysteriously going to disappear? We have to address problems. That's what the Torah is for. Torah is not to give us some unusual enlightenment that puts us in a different world where there's no problems there. The Torah is an instruction set of how to deal and manage problems, including the ones I mentioned today. And the reason why I started with such a negative subject is to get that type of attention, is to get somebody to become uncomfortable. Because the only way you're going to get yourself off the chair to deal with the problem is if you're uncomfortable. But if I gave you all sofas and beds, you all fall asleep. Because no one thinks it's a problem that there's people that think the Rebbe is God or that the Christians believe that some idiot that died on a cross is God and that seven billion people think that somebody is God and not God the fact that we're ignoring the problem is the problem the fact that we want to hear nice things no I'm here to learn Shio Torah what kind of Torah do you learn? What kind of Torah do you learn? Let me tell you the Torah I learned. Yeshua ben Pachet, do you know who he was? He was Jesus' rabbi. That's who he was. Did anybody know that? Do you know why he said this Mishnah? Do you know why Yeshua ben Pachet actually said this specific Mishnah? The sixth Mishnah in the entire Mishnah. Sixth one, which means level of importance. Level of closeness to Mount Sinai. Because of the issue that happened with Jesus. That's why he said it. This whole Mishnah is about what happened with Jesus. And we need to know what happened. Because number one, there's plenty of missionaries that are taking advantage of naive individuals that have no clue of what's right and what's left. And they're leaving pure Judaism and Torah and going to desecrating Hashem's name and going to Christianity and other types of idol worship. Or we have very nice people that have no clue what the truth is. But some priests hold them that makes everybody healthy but actually really work it's just to keep the money every month and maybe one day it's going to work we'll just make sure you keep use the chemo because that could help and they make all these weird things and they make people do weird things and they fill up football fields full of people 50, 100, 250,000 poor people to give this one guy that's a very clever speaker an audience and then a jet a 50 or 60 million dollar jet because he's a good speaker and he's speaking about idol worship and the fact that we ignore it and we let them do it when we are commanded by the Torah to be a light to the nations is a poor job by us but even if we ignore the goyim even if we say listen let them deal with their own problems. We're not necessarily obligated to go convert everyone. Fine. You could, there's some sages that you could rely on for that. Fine. What about the Jews? What about the Jews that are idol worshipping? What about the Jews that are worshipping their own rabbi? And going against his own Torah. What about the ones that said that Rabbi Nachman from Breslev said go to his gravesite on Rosh Hashanah but then they add, which he did say that, you should go. But they added something. Under all costs. And that's where you see people completely leaving their marriage, creating shlom bite problems, leaving their kids, leaving their wife. The only time of the year they actually have together is during the holiday time. The wife doesn't want them to go. The kids don't want them to go. It's finally they saw their dad the first time in the year. He works 900 hours a day. And no, he's not going to be with them. He's going to go in a gravesite with 30,000 other people. Now, if your wife agrees to it, and she's okay with it, and the whole house is cheerful about it, Chazaku Baruch, go to a gravesite, pray for me too. I need some prayers. But if your gravesite praying is going to create shlom bait problems, then you have a mental issue. You're going against the Torah that Rabbi Nachman actually taught. He didn't tell you to create Shlom Bayit problems. Do you know what Shlom Bayit is? We learned it from this week's parasha. This week's parasha, parashat Lech Lecha. 
God was willing to erase his own name for the sake of Shlom Bait. Erase his own name. That's why in the whole issue of Sota, when there's a wayward woman that's suspected of cheating on her husband, Hashem says the cure to know whether she's cheating or not, because in those days there's no private investigators. You take my name, you write it on a scroll, you put it into the holy water, the same water that the Kohanim used to wash their hands and their feet before they would, work, they would do the work of the Bet HaMikdash. You put it into that water where the ink would come out of the scroll and then you dr the woman would drink the water. If she cheated on her husband, she would blow up and die instantly. If she did it, she would get the blessing of the Kohen Gadol, which is the holiest man of the land. If she had trouble giving birth, she would be able to give birth. If she was giving birth to ugly kids, the kids would be beautiful. Different magical, mystical, amazing things directly from Hashem, but it's through a process that's in essence a sin. We are erasing Hashem's name. You're not allowed to erase Hashem's name. It's one of the commandments. You can't do it. You're not allowed to erase Hashem's name. Hashem says, no, no, no. You are allowed to erase my name because by erasing my name for this manner order only, You'll create Shalom Bayit. The husband is either going to know that his wife is righteous and he's wrong or he's going to know that she cheated on him and obviously he's not allowed to be with her anymore. And she gets punished for it. But from, for Shalom Bayit, you're allowed to erase a God's name. So do you think that Rabbi Nachman didn't know this? You think I know anything that he didn't know? You think Rabbi Nachman said, hey listen, come to my grave and pray and doesn't matter if it creates Shlom Bayit problems. What crazy person thinks that? Go ask Rabbi Aush. Tzaddik that he is. Read his book. Ask Rabbi Lazer Brody. Giant Chacham, giant Tzaddik. The protege of Rabbi Aush. Go ask him. Ask him what he thinks. Does he have Shlom Bayit problems when he goes to the grave? No, because his wife is on, on the same page as him. They go, they're excited, they go. But if you have Shlom Bayit because, problems because of it, if you're putting your whole life at risk for it, obviously you're not supposed to do it. So, the whole issue here is not the rabbis. The whole issue here is the students, not listening to the rabbis. And Rabbi Yoshua ben Pachia is telling us here, Ase lecha rav. Make yourself a teacher. Make yourself a rabbi. Meaning, you can't buy a rabbi. Like he said, acquire yourself a friend. Because if you buy a rabbi, then he's no longer your rabbi. He's your employee. The Chida, Zecher Tzadik Vekadosh Livacha, said that the Torah declared bankruptcy the minute that rich people started giving money to rabbis. Because they were no longer rabbis. As soon as rabbis started accepting huge sums of money from people, they were no longer able to rebuke them. Because if I rebuke you, knowing that you're going to give me a million dollars each year to fund my Bet Knesset, to fund my this, to fund my that, I'm going to think twice before I do it. Wait a minute, if I tell them, listen, you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat, by the way. Then you say, okay, I'm not allowed to drive on Shabbat. Okay, so I'm not allowed to give tzakah either. Hey, by the way, your wife, can you please tell her to put some clothes on? Oh, okay, yeah, tell her to put clothes on for somewhere else, for a different Bikneset. I'm not going to come anymore. The rabbi I want, the rabbi I'm going to give a million dollars to, is the rabbi is going to do whatever I want. He's going to change the Torah for me. That's not a rabbi, my friend. It's not a rabbi. A rabbi is the one that tells you what's in the Torah. A rabbi doesn't care what your opinion is. A rabbi doesn't care how big your wallet is. A rabbi doesn't care if you get offended or not. He'll do things in a nice way. Maybe it'll have a little bit more class than I do. But nonetheless, a rabbi only has da Torah. Only has the opinion of Torah. He only cares about the truth. If it's truth, I'll say it. If it's not, I won't. The fact that it offends people to know that there's something wrong should be more offensive to anyone who realizes that that's the problem. Because if we actually start listening to our rabbis, 
we realize that none of these problems would actually happen. If the Ture Karta actually read the books, read the teachings, heard the teachings, read all of the work that their Rebbe actually learned throughout his life, they would never imagine to go against Am Yisrael. They would never imagine to go and shake hands with terrorists. If the ones that call themselves Chabad that end up going and listening to the Torah that their holy Rebbe taught, they would never imagine to make him into a Mashiach because they'd know it's impossible. Once you die, you can no longer be a Mashiach. That's it. I didn't make this rule. God did. You have a problem? Go to Him. Everything I'm telling you and everything I say in all of my classes is basic level Judaism. There's no chumrah. I don't teach any chumrah. I don't teach any stringencies. The fact that you're not allowed to drive to shul on Shabbat is not a stringency. It's basic level Judaism. The fact that you have to eat kosher all the time and not just sometimes, it's basic level Judaism, which includes meat and dairy and everything else, even if it's candy. Everything has to be kosher. If it's not kosher, there's a reason for it. Everything we teach is basic. The problem in today's world is that there are so many rabbis that unfortunately have a yetzerah for money that it's hard for them to tell the truth. It's hard for them because, you know, listen, if I tell these guys the truth, then they're not going to come to shul anymore because if I tell them the truth, that if they drive on Shabbat and they're desecrating Shabbat, and if they're desecrating Shabbat, then they're not part of Minyan because they're not considered Jewish according to the Rambam, according to the Shulchan Aruch, according to the Zohar, according to the Gemara, according to every Jewish book there is that talks about Shabbat. You drive on Shabbat, you use your phone on Shabbat, you smoke on Shabbat, you're not considered Jewish. Your Judaism is on suspension. I didn't make the rule. Look at the books. Seven places in the Shulchan Aruch, all over the Zohar, all over the Gemara. In the written Torah, the oral Torah, any way you want. Just read the book. I read it, I saw it. I'm telling you it. Why did your rabbi say to you? I don't know. Is he a rabbi? Just because he has a title rabbi doesn't mean he's a rabbi. Because Yeshua Barachiyah here is saying, you have to make yourself a rabbi. But the rabbi that he's referring to is the one that tells you the truth all the time. Even if it's disturbing. Even if it's uncomfortable. Even if it makes you change. Even if it makes you get out of the chair and walk out of a class in the middle. It doesn't matter. Because if it's true, then it's true all the time. But if the Torah has 1% lies, then it's just, it's 100% lie with some truth in it. But then you can't decipher what's truth and what's not. It's either 100% truth and divine or 100% lie. You have to decide. If you believe the Torah is 100% divine, then you have to follow all of it. No exceptions. Even if you can't follow certain things, know that you're not allowed to do what you're doing, but eventually you'll try. Listen, when I first started doing tshuva, I knew you're supposed to keep Shabbat, I just wasn't ready. I knew you're supposed to do a lot of things. I wasn't ready. I still knew that I was supposed to do it. So don't say that just because you're not doing it, it's wrong. No, no, this part is not true. Just the stuff that I'm doing is right. It's nonsense. That means that Moshe Rabbeinu went to Gan Eden for the wrong reason. Avraham Avinu went to Gan Eden for the wrong reason. All the rabbis that write these books called Gemara, Shulchan Aruch, Me'am Loez, they just... They were fooled to do all these extra mitzvot. You got away with just one mitzvah. You're a tzaddik and they're all rashaim. Well, what's what happening? What's that? What, they all made a mistake? So obviously we have to understand what does it mean to make yourself a rabbi? A young man came once to the Slonim Rebbe, the Bet Avram. And he says to him, I learned almost all of the books of the Hasidic greats. I follow their advice. I try to incorporate into my lifestyle all, he wasn't even exaggerating here, all of the good practices they speak of. I see no reason to have a Rebbe. Just I learn all the books. 
Rashi says if you want to get friends, buy books. Rashi, Rashi. You can't read Torah without Rashi. One of the most important commentators that ever existed. He says you want to buy friends? Get yourself books. So this guy did it. He says I bought myself all these books. All these tzaddikim. I'm reading the books. What do I need a rabbi for? Sounds logical. And the rabbi responds to him, let me explain your situation in a parable. Once a man fell ill, and rather than visiting a doctor, he decided to go to a pharmacy on his own. He said, I'll buy all the medicines, and I'll take them, and that way I'll be cured of all diseases. There's no need to see a doctor. Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out it's not exactly a good solution because most likely after the third or fourth medicine, you most likely die. Because some medicines are countering a different medicine. If you take inappropriate amount or inappropriate medicine in general, you can kill yourself. He says the books are the medicine. The Rebbe is a doctor. I'll tell you exactly what to take and how to take it. If you're not ready, certain things in the book are not going to be relevant to you. And if you do them, you'll hurt yourself. Sometimes you start, somebody wants to read a book. They say, hey, listen, well, I just started Judaism. I went to a couple of classes. I saw a couple of people walked out. Sounds interesting. Let me read some Torah. He mentioned a few names. What name did he mention? Oh, he mentioned some guy named Rambam. Okay, so I go, you go to go online, go on Amazon.com, and you type in Rambam, and you see a few different books, and you pick one. It says, Guide of the Perplexed. It's like, oh, that's the one that I want to read as my first book in Judaism. There's a very high likelihood that after you read the book, you'll become against God. Not for God. Even though Rambam is holy. But if you don't have any concept of basic level Judaism, you're not even allowed to look at that book. As a matter of fact, if you don't have high level studies of Judaism, you shouldn't look at the book. Because even the sages of his time didn't understand his book when they first read it. They started burning it. They thought he was going against God. Thought he was using too much information from the Goim, like Aristo, Aristotle. Thought it was something out of this world. Too much. So you can't just pick and choose. Oh, no, this one says Jewish. I'll buy it. Or sometimes what happens, I had a student one time tell me, hey, listen, I just got this book. What do you think of it? And I look at the book, books looks Jewish, says Jewish stuff on it. But then I look at the publishing house, and I'm not really familiar with the publishing house. And usually, you know, Orthodox Jewish books, authentic books, it's not that many publishing houses. We're not like the English books where we have 500 publishing houses. So, we have a few that are familiar. And I'm not familiar with this one. So I look at the book, I see some guy's name. I don't know who the guy is, not that that means much. So I look him up. I say, oh, this guy, so-and-so, is head of reform uh, synagogue in, I don't know, I think California or something like that. I'm like, yeah, if you want to be a kofel, read the book, enjoy. If you want to believe that you're allowed to give bar mitzvahs to dogs, enjoy, enjoy the book. So, you can't just buy books. You have to know what to buy, first of all. Second of all, you need to know what to buy at your level. You have to learn A, B, C. You can't just go and, you know, first day of school, you're learning calculus math, getting ready for rocket science. First, you have to learn basic level algebra, basic level language. Then you'll get to the C, C, and all the other good stuff that's on programming. You can't just jump to everything. That's what a rabbi is supposed to tell you, he's supposed to guide you. But that's all, he's only going to be able to do that if you make him your rabbi. Not if you pay him to be. If you pay him, listen, we have a condition. 
I give you money, you let me do whatever I want. That's not a rabbi. That's an employee. If your rabbi is not telling you to keep Shabbat, if your rabbi is not telling you to keep family purity, if your rabbi is not telling you about modesty, if your rabbi is not telling you about relevant, basic level alachot that are relevant to the foundation of Judaism, sorry, he's not your rabbi. You could call him your rabbi all you want. Plenty of people have titles. It means nothing. You want a rabbi? You listen to the original rabbis. They're telling you you have to make one. But the way to make one, according to Chazal, you have to make one by finding one that's going to tell you the truth at all times. Without a care in the world about whether you like it or not. There's obviously different styles of how to say, what to say. But nonetheless, there's only a single truth. As far as acquiring a friend, we spend so much time on our friends. But why does it say acquire a friend instead of make a friend? Each one of us goes to a restaurant, you meet somebody, you go to work, you meet somebody, you meet different people. You didn't buy any of these people, you didn't acquire any of these friends. You just became friends. You don't have to acquire them. So why does they acquire a friend? He's saying because in reality, in order for you to have a true friend, you have to acquire them. Because the ones that you don't acquire are not really going to be your friends. They're going to be your acquaintances. If everything is good, how are you? When are we having the next party? When's the next Brit Milah? When's the next Bar Mitzvah? When's the next wedding? I'm going to get you an Aliyah. $18. $18. Chai. Chai for my friend. Chai. Give him an Aliyah. What about when you call him at 3 o'clock in the morning? Say, hey, listen. I, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, my house is actually going to foreclosure. I know you have a lot of money. Can you lend me $300,000? And I'll give it back to you when I get back on my feet. I'm sorry I'm calling you at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I can't sleep. Would you do it? Dude. What happened? Didn't pay his phone bill? What happened? Hey, by the way, I'm dying. I need a lung. You're the only one that matches. Did you give it to him? Did you give it to him? That's a friend. But you don't have many of those. Ask any old man how many friends you have. They're lucky if they say one. Ask anyone that's gone through life. I'm not talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 year olds. I'm talking about an old man, 70, 80, 90 years old. How many friends you have? If they have one, they're like, don't be so proud of mentioning this one. One guy I can tell you will give me his lung. That's what they'll tell you. Because they know what a friend is. But they have to go through 90 years to figure that out. We can go through a half hour lecture and realize it. Don't spend so much on your friends. Don't, the relationship is not as strong as you think. They come, they go. They offend you, you offend them. There's parties you go to, you don't go to. Everyone's unhappy all the time. Everyone has an excuse all the time. Fine. Develop a relationship with God. It's a better friend. Now Yeshua ben Pachia said this Mishnah to explain to us that when one makes himself a rabbi, that means that it doesn't matter whether what the rabbi says something that sounds good to you or not, once, or whether it makes sense to you or not, once the rabbi has said it, it's as if God said it himself. There's actually a part of the Gemara that says, fear your rabbi like you fear God. They're not saying that your rabbi is God. We're not the uh, crazy uh, people that we talked about earlier. See, when he's really your rabbi, then you know that what he's saying comes from God. Not his opinion. His opinion is meaningless. My opinion is meaningless. Your opinion is meaningless. Only opinion that matters is God's opinion. If he's really your rabbi, then you're always going to listen to him, even if it doesn't make sense. 
even if you don't agree with it. Even if you don't like it. Because you know that what he's telling you comes from God. Comes from the Torah. Because once somebody becomes a Rav, once somebody has become glued to the Torah on a regular basis, not once a week, day and night, they're glued to the Sefer Torah. They're learning. They're toiling. They're sacrificing. They're doing everything they possibly can to know what God said at all times. Then they don't have a mind of their own anymore. They've turned their mind into a holy mind, a divine mind, where their opinion no longer matters. And when you ask them a question, they give you an answer, and it doesn't make sense to you, you automatically accept it. And if you really meet him, you're of, you won't even ask him why. You go to any of these Avrahim, holy Avrahim, people that learn to love day and night, people that are serious people, you ask them, can you do me a favor? Can you call your rabbi? It's 8 o'clock at night. No, normal time, not like midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning. Can you call your rabbi? It's 8 o'clock at night just to ask him something for me. They look at you, what? Call my rabbi? Crazy? I'm going to call my rabbi? What happened? The disaster? No, no, I want an alakha question. He goes, go figure it out. What do you mean? I'll give you the alakha. No, no, can you ask your rabbi? No, I'm not going to bother my rabbi for this. They're so scared of their rabbi because they have the fear of God of their rabbi. They're only going to go when it's really, really necessary. He's not your friend. He's there to give you the word of God. He's not one of your buddies. Hey, what are you doing this weekend, rabbi? You watch the game? Hey, high five. The Patriots won. That's not a rabbi. It's a friend. It's nice. It's not your rabbi. Rabbi is the guy that's going to give you word of God. And you're going to listen to him and respect him such. Because sometimes what he's going to do doesn't make sense. And that's why Yeshua ben Pachia finished this Mishnah by saying, and judge everyone favorably. Judge everyone favorably means that if you see something that a righteous person does, and it doesn't make sense, it looks like it's a violation of the Torah. You're obligated to use the imagination that Hashem gave you to find an excuse of why he's allowed to do it. If he's righteous, you're obligated to do this. If he's wicked, even if you see him doing something wrong, uh, doing something right, then you're obligated to find something wrong in it. Examples. If you see your rabbi, holy rabbi that you have, the one that's given you dot to eye at all times, Lighting a fire, there's actually a famous story. One guy lived across the street from his rabbi, which he didn't necessarily listen to all the time or give him the kaf schut. He saw from his window to the rabbi's window, it was Shabbat afternoon, it was raining. He sees the rabbi lighting a fire in the middle of the living room. He's like, my rabbi is lighting a fire. Shemelchem, what kind of rabbi is this? I have to get to the bottom of it and call him out and tell him, hey, you can't be our rabbi anymore. He opens the door, he makes sure he brings the umbrella, he doesn't want to get wet. Opens the umbrella and he runs across the street. He barges into his rabbi's house, he says, hey rabbi, what are you doing with the fire? And he looks down and sees there's a pregnant woman giving birth and he's trying to make the room hotter because it's become life risk. And the holy rabbi looks at him and goes, My son, I'm trying to save a life, but you just violated Shabbat by opening the umbrella. He didn't give him kafschut. He didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. Despite the fact that his rabbi was a holy man, he was allowed to put Shabbat on hold for the sake of saving life. And that's why you're obligated to give someone that's known to be righteous the benefit of the doubt that even what they're saying that doesn't make sense or what they're doing doesn't make sense. There has to be a reason. According to Chazal, it's the only reason, the only reason why Hashem gave you an imagination. To create excuses for righteous people. When what they do doesn't make sense 
to our lowly mind. It's not to make cartoons. Your imagination is not to make iPhones or design applications. It's design excuses for why right righteous people are always righteous despite the fact that we don't see it. And why they're going to eventually get to a point despite the fact that they're going to start a lecture sometimes in a disturbing way. Even if they're just trying to be righteous. But if they're wicked and you see someone like Hitler, all of a sudden joins the Gemach. All of a sudden gives out free food. But he's known to be a, a wicked person. Then you are obligated to say it has to be poison or some type, something wrong in that food. Because he's known to be a wicked person. So now why did Yeshua ben Pachia say all of this in regarding to J.C. Penny in regards to Yeshu Yimachzimo Bidecho? Because as all, everyone knows, Jesus was originally a Jew. And he was actually one of the students that was excelling for Yeshua ben Pachia. But one day, when they're on their way back after they were in hiding for some time from uh, King Yanai, they found out that they were able to come back from Alexandria. But on the way, they stopped. They stopped on the way and a very gracious host hosted them. And Yeshua ben Pachia was saying, oh, what a gracious host we have. Meaning, they're so kind, they're letting us in their house, they're feeding us. But Jesus and took what his rabbi said the wrong way and thought that he was complimenting her looks. She said, no, she's not even good looking. Look at her eyes, they're so round. She said, wicked one, this is what you do? This is what you learned from me? Out. And he kicked him out of yeshiva. Banned him as a student. Jesus tried to come back. First two times he was rejected. Because obviously when you make such a grave sin of immodesty, of ungratefulness, of disrespect, of desecrating Hashem's name in public, you have to show that your tshuva is serious. You can't just say, oh, I'm sorry. You didn't break a plate. Desecrated Hashem's name. You're immodest. So I wanted to see you serious for the first two times you rejected him. And the third time, Yeshua ben Pachia was actually in the middle of Kriyat Shema. was praying, was doing Kriyat Shema. And as everyone knows, according to the Gemara Masechet Brachot, even if a king walks into the room and you're in the middle of Kriyat Shema, you are not allowed to stop. Not allowed to talk. A king. So Jesus didn't really have good manners apparently. He wasn't just a uh, looking at women, he was also forgetting what his teacher was teaching him in regards to Musar, so he de decided he's going to interrupt him in the middle of prayer. So obviously his teacher was planning on forgiving him, but he said, oh, you know, I can't talk to you right now, but come back later. Jesus didn't like what he heard, didn't take it as that, obviously, he thought that he's rejecting him a third time, and he left. And he went and started worshipping idols. And he started learning sorcery and started making magic tricks and different things to make other people follow him. Yeshua ben Pachia actually went and tracked him down and told him, repent. Come repent, I'll accept you back. I know you did this, you did this, you did this, I know. And Jesus said, 
You also taught me that someone that's a Mahdiya Rabim, someone that makes other people sin, they don't welcome him back. So I'm just going to stay where I am. And he decided to continue the rest of his life, fulfilling his desire of sinning, whether it would be with women or it would be by making people follow him. This, the source to this is in the Gemara, Masechet Sota, page 47a, Masechet Sanhedrin, page 107. And also in Masechet Shabbat. All parts of the Gemara. There's also some Midrashim and other places you can find it. Sometimes you'll find a co many copies of the Gemara where they actually don't mention Jesus' name. They mention student. And the reason why is because approximately 13 or 1400 years ago, the uh, Goim didn't like the fact that their uh, Messiah, their God, their whoever, their idol, was mentioned in such an unfavorable way in our Torah, so they started killing Jews over it. So for the sake of saving Jewish lives, we changed the name. But, obviously, Baruch Hashem, the truth always remains, and copies with the original truth remained, and we still have the truth that we still have from Mount Sinai. So now... The reason why Yeshua ben Pachya actually mentioned his whole Mishnah is because all of it tells us the story. This one Mishnah tells us everything that we just talked about. If J.C. Penny would actually value his Rav like he's a Rav. He would value his Rabbi like he's a Rabbi. Like you're supposed to. Like Yeshua ben Nun valued Moshe Rabbeinu. We waited for him fasting in the mountain until he came down 40 days later. Then he would never second guess his rabbi that even if what he said sounded unusual, sounded like he was complimenting a woman, he would never take it as such. He would either remain quiet or just create an excuse in his mind that this couldn't be. If Jesus would have actually had a friend, a friend that would tell him the truth also, because he acquired him and he worked hard to make sure that he has somebody that, hey, listen, I'll do whatever you want me to do if I don't have any money, but just make sure that if I have a fall, if I have a stumble, if I ever go in the wrong way, you're going to be that friend that's going to give me the lung I need. You're going to be that friend that's going to give me the truth I need. You're going to be the friend to save me before I fall and can't get up anymore. If he had one friend in the world that he acquired, it wouldn't have happened. And if he would have just given the Rav Kafschut, benefit of the doubt, it wouldn't have happened. But all of it has the same foundational problem as Neture Karta, the Messianic Chabad, and the other sex that I mentioned before. Buying a friend is easy. You don't necessarily always need money. Buying a friend is not that difficult. Making yourself a rabbi depends how much ego you have. You have a lot of ego, you have a lot of work to do. If you, could, if you are willing to eliminate your ego, you can make yourself a rabbi. Why? Because whatever he says, you go by. You don't need to kiss his hand. You don't need to kiss the Torah. You just need to listen to it. When secular people come to the shul once a year on Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, and they start kissing the Sefer Torah, the Sefer Torah is screaming back to them, don't touch me, just listen to me. You don't need to kiss the hand. Just listen. Ask him, what does God say? Show me. Open a book. What Gemara says this? What Shulchan Aruch says this? What's the Alachat for this? How do I get Shlom Bayit? How do I raise my kids? What's the divine knowledge say? Should I do this contract? Should I not? Should I do this deal? Should I not? Is it kosher to charge my customer for three hours when I only did two hours worth of work? Now I'll ask you guys a question. Originally, I wanted to start the lecture with this, but Baruch Hashem, 
got a little confused and forgot it. So apparently I was supposed to say it now. I'm going to ask you guys a question. I'm going to ask you guys an interesting question. A certain thing happened, a certain event happened where one guy had two baseball cards. When I was a kid, I used to collect baseball cards. I was maybe 12, 13 years old. And I remember back then, there was a famous card for a player named Anas Wagner. That was a player maybe over 100 years ago. And apparently in those days, they would make cards out of tobacco. And he was against it. So he refused that anyone would print the card with his picture on it. And they did anyway. And he sued them. And they ended up removing them from circulation with the exception of a handful or so. So very, very few left in circulation, which made it very rare, which made it the most expensive baseball card in the world. So when I was a kid, 12, 13 years old, it was $600. $600,000, I'm sorry. $600,000 for a card. Today it's worth millions. Because people are crazy. But nonetheless, baseball cards. So imagine somebody has two of them. And there's only two in the world. And each one's worth, let's say, $2 million. So what do you do when you have expensive stuff? What do you do? Show it off. So you call your buddy. Hey, buddy, I want to show you my two cards I just bought. And your buddy comes. You show him the cards. Wow. On a Swagner, $2 million. On a Swagner, $2 million. Great. And he gives you one back. He looks at the other one. And he takes it. And he rips it. Now, obviously, you want to kill him. But before you kill him, he says, listen, before you kill me, listen to what I'm saying. Right now, I know baseball cards. Your friend's an expert. So I'm an expert baseball card person. Before I ripped it, there was two in the world. You had both of them. Each one of them was worth $2 million. Now there's only one in the world, and it's actually worth $10 million. So as a matter of fact, I just did you a favor. I just made you $6 million. I would like at least $3 million. 50% of the profit. Thank you. Who's right? Option A. Option A, he owes the guy that ripped the cards $3 million. Option B, he owes him $6 million. Option C, he doesn't owe him anything. Option D, the guy that ripped it owes him $2 million. Yeah. Which one? Are wrong. So which one? So what's... This is very materialistic. Right, but it's, it's all about material here. But he ripped the card, the other guy made money. Even though he, made, he could have made six extra million dollars, he doesn't have the right to break, to break the, the card or to intrude the other guy. Right, you're right. So he's not, he's not, he should not rip his stuff. But... The fact that he did rip it made the other guy money. So, would you say that he should give him part of the profit? I think so. He should give him part of the profit. So, since he made six million dollars, he should give him three million back. The guy that ripped the cards. As if he's a professional, he's charging the service. So he's, so he's right for ripping his card. So if I go to your house and I say, listen, your house is worth ten million dollars, but your insurance policy is worth 15 million. So if I burn your house, I actually made you $5 million. I'm doing you a favor. Give me $2 million back. I think it's different to burn a house. Same thing. If, what? Your house is worth 10 million or 2 million. If, if, if I made you money. Great. It would create disaster. If it would have been agreed beforehand, if the guy would have said, listen, I know how to make it. No, if it would have agreed beforehand, then I'd rip it myself. No, but you can say, I have an idea. Not as a rabbi, as a consultant, <laughs> as a businessman. I have an idea and I will charge yeah. you for this idea. Nah. He can say, I know this is four million, I know a way of making ten million now, and you know, do you agree? Okay. You, you guys are very good lawyers. Six million, well, I'm a lawyer. Ah, okay, well, Hashem, now I know. <laughs> What do you think, Nirel? Here's going to be six million, and you want to split it? Do you so you think you should, give, you should give him part of the profit? If, if they agree yeah. No, no, forget it, but this is the way it happened. The way it happened is exactly as I said. No, now we shouldn't give him anything. We shouldn't give him anything. No. But, sh okay, so... C. So, C. so C is that he doesn't... He keeps... There, there, so he's even. Yeah. So the guy that got lost... He lost one card, but he gained money, so that means that... He shouldn't give the other guy anything. The other guy didn't lose anything. The guy, the owner of the cards, didn't lose any money, any material. Right. So... He lost a card. Now what he gained... Well... And he got more money. If the card is worth to him more, then... The, 
you, you got to listen to if, if so wait so if I go to your okay so you have your house is a million dollars if you if you're gonna tell if you're gonna say well this card has an emotional value it was worth to me more let alone the money then then you gotta listen to that even emotions have a price okay let's say the emotion is worth another million dollars so you still have a profit so you, does okay. he still does he still have to pay him okay. does he have to pay him or nothing oh he's break even if, if if you can quantify emotion and if it's a million dollars no then the guy didn't make any loss because now he has to he still has a profit so he still hasn't, doesn't have to give him anything yeah. Okay, never next. He never sold like, the car. It's, it's worth it, but he didn't sell the car for 10 million. No, so let's say there's a buyer, runs into the room. Well, hypothetical scenario. I came in, I have $10 million. Hey, I want that card. Yeah, that one, $10 million. Yeah, I had baseball cards when I was 12. I just saved $10 million to get the card. I'll pay for it, $10 million. Does the guy that ripped the card owe him any money? He doesn't owe him any money, even though he ripped his card. But there's also another point. You can also say if the guy had two cards, who knows now that they're both two million, but maybe to next week or next month they're both ten million. I don't know. That would be a possibility. You could. So does he owe him any money or not? The owner, the, owner, the owner could say, "Listen, now today it's ten million, but I never wanted to sell, so now I have to sell my only card for ten million, and maybe next week I could have sold one card and kept one card next week." Yeah, whole ten million. Bottom line: today, judge comes. Does he owe money or not? Guy ripped the card. You owe him the money or no? No, no. Doesn't owe him. Doesn't you, what do you, Nirel? Does judge come today? Judge coming today. Does he owe him any money or no? It will be on D. Huh? What's D? The, the guy who ripped the card. Oh. He destroyed yeah. the property of the other guy. He owes okay. him money. He owes him money. Oh. Nirel, Nirel has a benefit over you guys. Probably so I have to, have to disclose this benefit. Nirel has been my student for a year and a half. Yeah. So he has a rav. So. Reason why D is right. The reason why the guy that ripped the card owes two million dollars exactly is because the cards were originally the property of the first person, of person A. The guy that ripped it destroyed his property, which at that time was worth two million dollars. He only he owes him how much it's worth at that time. He doesn't owe him how much it could have been worth or was worth. It was worth, at that moment, $2 million. Now, the fact that the card went up from $2 million to $10 million has nothing to do with the guy that ripped it because he doesn't own it. It's not his asset. It's like me saying, listen, I think your house is going to go up from $1 million to $100 million, and it does. It doesn't matter. It's not my property. It's your property. You own it. I have no share in your card. Therefore, I can't benefit from your card. And that's also the reason why he only owes him $2 million versus owing him actually $10 million. Because technically, if the card is now worth $10 million and he was supposed to be a partner in the card, he's also a partner in the loss, which means I lost a $10 million card and not a $2 million card. So in essence, what Da Torah is, the mind of the Torah says, is that he actually lost $2 million, therefore he owes him $2 million. Right. So that's the thing. So that's why Lecha is divine. Halakha is basic, it's the logic that's divined by Hashem, and the secular knowledge unfortunately sometimes goes against it. Now what if the guy goes out and he's selling the card for 10 million, so he made a lot of money? Great, good for him, has nothing to do with the guy, the guy, the guy that destroyed it still owes him 2 million dollars. There's no relation between that? Why relation? Why is there a relation? There is a he relation. doesn't own it, he doesn't own it. If we were allowed to destroy somebody, he created value. He didn't create any value, he destroyed value. He the value, value was. He destroyed value for one card, but for the other card. But it wasn't. It was. You know, he you can't say that he didn't create value for the second card. Yes, but if if that was if that would be allowed, then we would bring Sodom and Gomorrah to the world because people would say, "Listen, everyone. If you look at most people's houses, the overwhelming majority of houses have more insurance on them than the property is worth. It's a reality. It's usually you buy more insurance than what you need." Which means that I would, I would be able to go to everybody's houses, burn the whole neighborhood, say, hey, by the way, guys, I made you all money. Each one of your houses is worth a half a million. Your policy is a million. Each one of you made a half a million dollars. Give me half. I did you a favor. It would, be, it would create havoc in the world. So you can't just take things, you can't just take matters into your own hands. If you have an agreement, like you said before, where you have an idea to create value, it's a different story. But nonetheless, the point I'm trying to make here is that when you have a rav, when you have a rabbi,
Before you make such a move, before you make such an agreement, you go to that rabbi. You go and you ask him, A, B, C, am I allowed to make this business transaction? Am I not allowed to make this transaction? Is this kosher? Is this not kosher? Somebody asked me today, listen, am I allowed to charge my client for three hours when, I only, when the work only took me two hours? Now, it's a yes and a no. If it's commonly done in three hours, but you worked extra fast to make it finish in two hours, then you're allowed to charge for three hours. But if it normally takes two hours, but you just feel like charging three hours, then you're not allowed. Same token is that you could actually charge three hours worth of value, but just make it as a contract, that that's what you know, it's worth, versus just saying this is for three hours because sometimes you only work 15 minutes, but you still want to get paid for three hours. So you're better off being a contractor versus getting paid hourly. So each one of these things, there's an alakhad, there's a way, there's, a, there's an answer to all of it. And in essence, it's the point of having someone that's going to give you the alakhad because sometimes the alakhad is very easy to understand. It's black and white. Sometimes it's going to give you a mental battle for years because you just won't get it. But the key of having a rav is having someone that you're willing to submit to because you know that he's not he's himself submitting to his rav and his rav and his rav and his rav and ultimately they're all submitting to Hashem and they're saying, listen, whatever it says in your Torah, whether we like it, agree with it, it's irrelevant. We're going to follow it. If we all can just do that, then we can bring salvation to the world. Then we can eliminate the fake sects within our nation, whether it's the fake Chabadniks, the fake Messianics, and the fake everyone else. And to tell anyone that actually thinks that I'm against any organization, it's a complete lie. Because some of the great stories that I say are about Chabadniks, are about people from uh, Breslev, and so on. The key that you have to understand is the founders of that organization are some of the greatest people that ever lived. There's a book called the, To Remain a Jew that was written by Rabbi Zilber. And Zechat uh, Tzadik Livacha. Extraordinary book. One of my students actually got it for me as a present and it's mamash. It makes, every page makes you do tshuva. It's his life story. It's something out of this world. And he tells his story of different things that he went through his whole life and different people that he met. And many of the people that he met were Chabadniks. They practically built Judaism in Russia. Without, without Chabad, there wouldn't be no Judaism. But they were as zealous as can be for Judaism to such an extent where he says one story. You weren't allowed to practice Judaism. They would go to jail for, and sometimes get the death penalty for keeping Shabbat. Keeping Shabbat. To keep Shabbat, one, one, uh, one rabbi, Rabbi um, Rabinovich, I think it was, or Branovich, I forget the name, I'm sorry. Um, he, um, he went to jail, and in jail, and this is not jail like the Taj Mahal we have in America. Jail in Russia was Gehenom, on earth. Slave labor, cold at all times, barely any food, nightmare, 24 hours a day. Most people would not even make it out. So in jail, he still found a way to keep all of the mitzvot, one of which was to wear a tzitzit that nobody wants to wear anymore today. Wear a tzitzit. So he made, got the strings, put them on his clothes, made himself a tzitzit in jail. So one day the head of the jail calls him in and he comes in with his tzitzit. You're not allowed to be religious. You're not allowed to be Jewish. That's why you came into jail for the first place. And he says to him, how dare you wear that thing? Take it off right now. And the rabbi says, what? Take that off right now. He says, want me to take this off? He goes, take it off. He goes, want me to take off my tzitzit? He screams at the bottom of his lung. He goes, you want me to take off my tzitzit? Pah! and punched the guy in the face and started beating him up until they stopped him and almost killed him. For him to take off his tzitzit was worth putting his life on the line. Find me one Chabadnik like that. That's telling people it's okay to drive on Shabbat. There are, of course, many holy ones that are still around. But they're not Messianics. They're not the ones that I mentioned in the groups before. The ones that are reading... 
the real work of Chabad, the ones that are really reading the work of Rabbi Nachman, or any of the major sages of past, they're not doing anything stupid by telling people, listen, drive on Shabbat for the first year, and the next year we'll talk about it. You're never allowed to sin. The fact that you sin is your problem, but you're never allowed to. Yes, everybody has gradual levels of how they do tshuva. But don't ever think it's okay. It's okay for now that, you know, you're sinning. It's okay for you. It's not okay for Shemaim. Because other Shem, eventually you'll realize it's a, it's a, you'll have to do tshuva for that too. Because we can't just change our life overnight. I get it. I did it also. It's not overnight. But don't think it's okay to drive on Shabbat. Don't think it's okay to eat pork once in a while. It's never okay. Just that you can't handle that Yetzirah. You can't handle conquering all of them at once. But if you actually learn of the people that built this organization and you see how zealous they were for Hashem, every single mitzvah they did, they were willing to sacrifice their life for. Every single mitzvah. Rabbi Zilber says in, in the book that for him, he was willing to sacrifice his life just to find a way in jail. He was also in jail. Unfortunately, all of these big tzaddikim went to jail, got tortured in different ways. He sacrificed his life to find a way to get a nail for Hanukkah, a candle for Hanukkah. To get a candle, to get the wax for a candle, for Hanukkah. That's a mitzvah of De Rabbanan. It's a rabbinical mitzvah. It's not even Deoraita. Sacrificed his life just to get the candle. Find guys, go. Find them around. They don't make them like that anymore. And our only chance of getting back to that, our only chance to become zealous for Hashem like that, our only chance to love Hashem like that, our only chance to fear Hashem like that, is starting with number one, face reality. Number two, get yourself a rav. Number three, buy yourself a friend that's going to tell you the truth whenever your rav is not around. And three, Give everyone kafschut if they're righteous and make sure not to give them kafschut if they're not righteous because you're not allowed to. Any questions? Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.